Welcome back to War Economy and State. This is the Mises Institute's Foreign Policy and International Relations podcast. And I am here today joined by my co-host, Zachary Yost. And this is where we talk about issues that are a little beyond the usual economic topics and domestic policy and look at what is the United States doing out in the world in relation to other states uh, and also just discuss some strategic issues and uh, basically how the, the U.S. regime is getting most of that all wrong. And the latest evidence of that is what was recently released from the White House, which was their national security strategy uh, here for the new fiscal year. And uh, it's awful. Uh, <laughs> looking at it, uh, this is about, I don't know what, 50 pages of uh, going on and on about uh, global warming, uh, about COVID, about... Uh, Democracy versus autocracy, lots of topics covered here. And basically the impression you're left with is that the United States should use its foreign policy to be involved in basically everything and not just the strategic issues related to maintaining defense at all, but really in terms of dealing with COVID, dealing with environmental policy, uh, ensuring human rights are uh, uh, respected worldwide and all of those issues. So Zach and I are just going to go through and pick out some of the more alarming uh, or terrible parts of this. And we'll put a link to it in the, in the description and uh, just basically get a sense of where foreign policy uh, is going, or at least where the White House would like to take it. Now, this is a lot like when the White House puts a budget out in the sense of this is what we would like to see, or this report is essentially a press release about what our political priorities are. And actually, this reads very much like a press release, uh, a very long press release. And uh, I can imagine like some really, uh, um, what, I don't know, a, a, <laughs> a very ideological, a very... Uh, ambitious 28-year-old writing this for the administration and thinking, boy, we're going to conquer evil here in the next 10 years if we can carry out this report. Uh, but really, this report's going to be read in Congress, and, and then Congress, especially the House, now that's controlled by, by Republicans, will pull the parts out, out of it that serve the Republicans' interests. And so, uh, obviously, we can't read this as any sort of, like, something that's about to be enacted over the next year or five years or ten years. Um, but I think it does illustrate what this administration thinks is important and also, I think, perhaps illustrates uh, what just the general foreign policy consensus is in the Beltway as well. Uh, so let's just kind of uh, let's just start out with uh, looking at uh, some of the basics of here. And I, and I would say my main takeaway was that there is no portion of the world that is not considered to be uh, a target for the United States in terms of policy, in terms of meddling, in terms of uh, what they call, you know, building bridges. It's uh, it's just it's just an announcement of. Every region in the world is of interest to this regime, and we will not butt out anywhere in the whole world. Uh, of course, the problem of that is that what it, it means when every part of the world is a priority, then no part of the world is a priority. So reading this, you can't even guess about which part of the world is most important right now, except maybe for the stuff about how China is the most important uh, strategic challenge. But part of dealing with China involves apparently being active everywhere, the Middle East, Africa, Indo-Pacific, Europe, and of course, Latin America as well. So you name it. So it uh, <laughs> get ready. Uh, the entire globe is, uh, is a place where the United States needs to be, needs to be spending money, needs to be maybe even starting wars if necessary. And uh, I think a, a sane person should probably find that to be a little bit alarming. Yeah, it's uh, such a core aspect of this document as well as just U.S. foreign policy in general is the idea of the global order. And it's just uh, uh, foreign policy wonks need to read more Hayek, I suppose, because uh, for them, this order is purely constructed. Uh, it's a constructivist, rationalist, constructivist uh, entity, as uh, Hayek would put it. And uh, 
without U.S. involvement everywhere, everything would just collapse. It's sort of a very, um, uh, what's the, uh, what's the word, uh, uh, a very uh, codependent relationship. Uh, the US, everyone needs the U.S. and the U.S. needs everyone needing us to, <laughs> so all of the bureaucrats and think tank, uh, you know, uh, nerds can feel that their life has some overriding important purpose. <laughs> it's the <laughs> sort of cynical, uh, you know, armchair psychologist view of of why everywhere is important all the time and needs us to do something. Well, and the intro makes that clear, right? Is that uh, that <laughs> a three hundred and sixty degree strategy uh, is is a one phrase that uh, is under Joe Biden's signature in the introduction. <laughs> and yeah, and that that paragraph had the, my favorite line. Um, he says, "I'm more confident than ever that the United States has everything we need to win the competition for the twenty first century." We emerge stronger from every crisis. And then the, the golden line, there is nothing beyond our capacity. We can do this for our future and for the world. And it's like, nothing is beyond our capacity. Uh, do we live in a post-scarcity world? I mean, no, I, uh, like uh, <laughs> just one of the core aspects of human existence, as Mises tells us, is, you know, scarcity and the infinite... Uh, wants that will be unfulfilled. I mean, that's the very core of acting man is unfulfilled wants. So it's just nothing is beyond our capacity, just flies in the face of basic sound economic logic and just is sort of mind boggling. <laughs> you know where that line would go really well would be like on one of those like 1930s Soviet Union posters <laughs> yes. where there's like a, a worker and he's looking off into the at the horizon or maybe at the sunrise and uh, he looks all healthy and and uh, young and efficient and then written right under it nothing is beyond our capacity yeah yeah, I must admit, I do love uh, uh, socialist realist art. <laughs> just, uh, I don't... Yeah, so you, it would look good, yeah, right? Yeah, it would. I, I don't know if it's being from Pittsburgh, industrial, rust belt. It's just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I love that art <laughs> style, even though, it, you know, propaganda can be, uh, if you recognize it's propaganda, you can appreciate it as an art form in its, of itself. <laughs> well, of course, you know, I don't mind some good 16th century Christian propaganda from Florence, yeah. right? I mean, that's <laughs> essentially what some of those statues are. And uh, that's, it's beautiful in many cases. So, however, uh, <laughs> if only, if only this report had uh, had uh, some art or flair to it. Yeah, but, it, uh... it doesn't approach Dante's Inferno in terms of, you know, <laughs> uh, all my enemies are burning in hell, uh, done with style. <laughs> But yes, <laughs> it, it reads like a Stalinist five year plan in some respects. Like I'm I'm looking at it and and it covers industrial policy and it has phrases like markets alone cannot respond to the rapid pace of technological change, global uh, supply disruptions uh, et cetera, et cetera. Strategic public of in investment is the backbone of a strong industrial and innovation base in the 21st century global economy. I, I, this is I, what I thought of this when I saw this was a thing about how Truman tried to nationalize the steel industry back in the fifties and just how basically the economy is here to service uh, global uh, international relations goals and and that the market isn't enough, therefore, right? Because the markets would just try to uh, deliver to people what they need. So therefore, where the report goes from there, of course, is well, we need subsidies, we need a plan, we need uh, all sorts of central government meddling in order to make sure that the economy is delivering what we think it should deliver. And it's uh, it's just astounding that uh, this is <laughs> that this is an American document. I can only imagine something like this <laughs> being read in 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 uh, 1881. Uh, I, I just imagine what uh, Grover Cleveland would think of something like this, where basically everything exists 
uh, for strategic purposes. And uh, it's just so anti-liberal, liberalism in the good sense, that it's really quite remarkable uh, because so much of the article reads that way. Because not only... It, 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 there's no separation between domestic policy and foreign policy at all. That it's really just all the same thing. All the same goals are there from COVID to the environment uh, to equity and and ensuring that that's all respected worldwide. That uh, it uh, that it really would be appropriate uh, <laughs> to reflect this in some sort of socialist propaganda from 80 years ago. Regarding uh, public investment, it's just sort of um, government-funded research is generally just so <laughs> inefficient and uh, cost overruns and takes so long. I mean, um, I mean, you, Elon Musk is a you know a rent harvester, but I mean, look at how far he's gone with in regards to spaceflight and things like that compared to like NASA. I mean, uh, proposed budgets for, you know, various uh, launch systems and things are like, oh, this will take years and years and years and cost gajillions of dollars. And uh, I can't remember the exact specific thing, but it might have been like a low orbital launch vehicle or whatever it was, but it was like Elon Musk did it in like, just, you know, in SpaceX did it just a few years and for gajillions of dollars less. So it's sort of uh, um, uh, just so bizarre that, I mean, there's various reasons for this, but I mean, like the United States, like nuclear arsenal, the ICBMs still run off of uh, floppy disks. <laughs> and it's sort of, you know, this is the entity that will, uh, you know, usher in innovation. I mean, uh, here, just north of where I am in Pittsburgh, uh, the government's um, retirement record repository is kept in an abandoned limestone mine. Uh, everything is on paper. I mean, it's just this vast warehouse uh, where <laughs> filled with file cabinets um, that is actually, you know, they have those bureaucratic efficiency uh, measurement systems, things are less efficient now than they were in the 70s in this system that's still entirely on paper. And it's just the idea that this is the entity that will, you know, be at the forefront of leading innovation and research regarding defense or really anything else is just so laughable. Well, unfortunately, a lot of conservatives fall for that, right? Is because the one minute post about how the government can't do health care right, they can't deliver the mail on time. Uh, but boy, uh, <laughs> America's going to use smart bombs in the next war and not kill any civilians. And they're going to install a new regime in country X with uh, minimal blowback or inefficiency. And it's just astounding what they will ascribe to the abilities of the regime, so long as it's along the lines of what we want the regime to do. But they're totally inefficient doing everything else. But, of course, experience has shown, hey, let's look at Iraq. Let's look at Afghanistan. I mean, where <laughs> Neither of those operations were efficient as well, not to mention the, what, the $6 trillion spent on them. And then, of course, there's the fact that the Pentagon routinely is failing its audits and uh, is just has a couple trillion dollars missing. And so th that, that should all be remembered when you're reading the strategic report, is that this is going to be done primarily through the Pentagon, which has no idea how much money it even spends or where that goes and has lost uh, two wars in the last 20 years. And, uh, you know, they like to blame the politicians for it. But part of the, the justification of those wars is that it would be won quickly and that it would be easy and it would be a cakewalk. And especially in the case of Iraq, and none of that turned out to be true. And so it turns out that you actually do need uh, much more uh, difficult problem-solving <laughs> abilities that apparently the Pentagon lacks. And, and so there's just way too much enthusiasm about getting involved in every aspect of the globe here. Right. Yeah. Regarding the Pentagon audit, I can't remember exactly what year, but uh, some law was passed that all of the parts of the government have to have routine audits. And for like 20 years, the Pentagon did not do that. They kept getting basically waivers because they're like, we're not capable of actually even doing the audit. And then uh, a few years ago, they're like, we're going to do the audit. And they failed every annual audit since then. Um, 
yeah, it, uh, it's just mind boggling. Um, for it, yeah, it's just quite um, depressing. Well, the fact that right, we've got the audit, the Fed movement. Or remarkable that there wasn't a audit the Pentagon movement alongside should have been every bit as as popular. Uh, I'm sure Ron Paul would have been fine with auditing right. the the, uh, the, <laughs> the Pentagon. And I think it's just sort of so, like I don't know super wonky accounting like there will be headlines like oh the pentagon you know a trillion dollars is you know missing or something and it's not like in my understanding it's not actually like a trillion dollars has just disappeared it's just that due to their sloppy accounting it's just all these accounting errors add up to a trillion dollars um uh, or more now by this point um but speaking of lost wars the the strategy does mention Afghanistan, and um, uh, sort of the only positive thing I saw in the document was there were two mentions that um, the, the, the U.S. government doesn't want to pursue remaking other societies in America's interest. So when it's like Biden trying to pass off Afghanistan, which I'm glad we left, though the way in which we left was such a disaster, but... Uh, the document says, we ended America's longest war in Afghanistan and with it an era of major military operations to remake other societies. So I think, you know, that's helpful signaling, at least, that uh, we don't want to pursue another Afghanistan or Iraq. And I think part of that has to do with the, re the, the new emphasis on China. It's like, we can't afford <laughs> to be wasting gajillions of dollars uh, trying to turn, you know, Afghanistan into, you know, America when we're dealing with China, um, which it identifies as basically the main geostrategic threat going forward. Right. It does. It That is the one indicator, I think, that there's some actual priorities contained somewhere in this document. And the, it correctly notes, of course, that uh, it, it does it as much as the, <laughs> the Biden administration hates Russia. Russia isn't uh, at the level of a major potential global hegemon of any kind. Um, now, I'm not even sure China is a global hegemon contender, but it's certainly a regional one, much more so than Russia and has just much, much greater capacity and even with it going into decline, right, we can look at these numbers on demographics and population and how it might be only half a billion people 30 years from now. But uh, even then, that's, uh, it, it's, it's going to be a place that's, uh, that matters, especially in East Asia. So, and, of course, the U.S. wants to maintain its control of the first and second island chains there east of China. And so that's just going to continue to be an issue, even if China goes into relative decline. But other than that, as you noted with the line of how nothing is beyond our capacity, there's really nothing that is beyond the interest of the regime. And you can see that here when you just start reading part one of the report, talks about the U.S.'s enduring role. So, of course, the United States cannot withdraw from the world in any way. That would be horrible, horrible isolationism. Uh, because, of course, the way the, uh, the, the myth goes is that every time something bad happens in the world is because the U.S. was too isolationist, because the U.S. was too uninvolved in the world. And I remember that being a narrative after 9-11, was that oh the the U.S. had withdrawn from the world and had barely was barely doing anything in the globe and was just looking inward, which of course was absolute complete nonsense, <laughs> but that was the narrative. And so okay, we have an enduring role. Next is uh, recasting the whole world in sort of a Cold War like competition between democracies and autocracies. And I'm sure anyone who's been reading foreign policy news has noticed that, right? Is that's the line. We're a democracy, everybody else is autocracies. I'm pretty sure though that reading this, I didn't see a single mention of Saudi Arabia. Well yeah, they sort of mention it. Uh it's so they they say, you know, oh, there's the democracies versus autocracies. But in the first paragraph, they say um, uh, it includes our democratic allies in Europe and the Indo-Pacific, as well as key demo 
democratic partners around the world that share much of our vision for regional and international order, even if they don't agree with us, blah, 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 and countries that do not embrace democratic institutions, but nevertheless depend upon and support a rules-based international system. So it's like, that's the exception for Saudi Arabia and, I don't know, the Philippines. And Egypt the, also. Yeah, yeah, Egypt, which we give like $4 billion to every year. Yeah. Right. The, and where we actively ensure that our, our preferred dictator is in place. Even yeah, and they're, it, they're... It, it, they do say, you know, it, it, they do frame it this sort of Cold War autocracy, autocracies versus democracies. And then in the final paragraph, they say, we don't want a new Cold War, <laughs> but it's just like, OK. Yeah, I mean, they've split the world into two pieces. What, what do they think the outcome is going to be of that? And uh, it uh, and it's remarkable, right, how they then go on to mention Iran later, uh, which is significant. Well, I certainly would prefer to not live in either Iran or Saudi Arabia. Uh, I would prefer to live in Iran if my only two choices were Iran and Saudi Arabia. There are at least some government institutions outside the reach of the of a tiny elite at the top, which is not really the case in Saudi Arabia. There are actual um, there is guaranteed representation in parliament for Jews and Christians to some extent, whereas those things are basically illegal in Saudi Arabia. And uh, <laughs> there's just no religious freedom whatsoever under the Saudi, uh, the blood-soaked Saudi regime. But that's of, that's part of the rules-based international order, whereas the Iranians are, uh, are, are enemies of that. And it's just so... It's... it's it's disappointing. I don't know that that's the word. It's uh, it's repugnant. It's despicable. Yeah, I mean the the Saudi war in Yemen, which has been going on forever. Right, and and I mean it's just come out and admit you just you like the Saudis, so that means you have to hate the Iranians because the Saudis and the Iranians hate each other. They've been, they're 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 in a long long game trying to exert influence over the Persian Gulf region. Their enemies, the U.S. Uh, therefore, wants Iran uh, obliterated. I mean, it's it's just such typical. Hey, the <laughs> I, I I hate the enemy of my friend, and uh, but they never ever mention that. And you would think that there was no sort of history between the Saudis and Iran at all. There's a very annoying line. Um, I, I don't I can't find it right off the top of my head, but that basically. And th this is how all, all everything is always framed, including with Russia and China in this document. But in regards to Iran, it, it's always um, framed as if uh, like the Iranian people are just completely, they're just Americans waiting to be free uh, and that they, they no one supports the government. <laughs> I mean, this is not true <laughs> in, in uh, any three places. I mean, the governments do enjoy plenty of support. Um, and just, it's a sort of, uh, I mean, there are dissenters. I mean, Iran, I mean, there's been all kinds of protests that have been brutally suppressed. So there are people who don't like the government, but there's plenty of people who love the government and are, you know, fans of, you know, mowing down protesters. Uh, so it's sort of, it, it just creates this false idea that, you know, the U.S. just puts a little, it's part of this, the plan is, you know, we're going to support the people to, you know, institute a new government in line with, you know, our conception of the global order. Yeah, it's just, uh, that's a fresh, because it's so factually incorrect, like beyond what you hope for. It's just, not true. And that was what uh, Donald Rumsfeld promised in Iraq. And that's what we were told in Venezuela, is that nobody supported the regime. And it's still there and appears to have uh, a significant amount of support. So uh, I, I, I guess that's just the standard strategy, is, is con convince Americans of that. Right. And I, I forget, I think it's ExxonMobil. I can't recall what giant oil company just got like a permit to begin like exporting Venezuelan crude. It's good US, that I we believe. didn't end um, up with a quote unquote humanitarian invasion uh, in Venezuela, but it seemed like they were pushing for that for, for a period, but I didn't see really, there wasn't much mention of that except uh, in the section on Latin America. 
Right. Yeah. It it's sort of like a funny um, I don't know time capsule. Uh, so I don't know. It was like ten years ago. The first Avatar movie came out. And uh, one of the mercenaries is like, oh, yeah, I fought in Venezuela. <laughs> uh, uh, and so it's just, you know, back, people did think that back, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, that that could be a realistic uh, place for a uh, U.S. soldier to be fighting. And that I do, it, it, the, the document says that the Western Hemisphere is the most important um, part of the globe for the United States, something like $1.8 trillion in trade and yada, yada. And um, I mean, I agree with that. And it's like if Zach was king or something and was uh, in charge of instituting a foreign policy, our foreign policy would be much more, you know, neo-Monroe doctrine focused. We would be very engaged with the Western Hemisphere. But uh, going back to the intro line of nothing's beyond our capacity, obviously <laughs> it is. <laughs> I mean, we can't do everything at once. And to my mind, the Western Hemisphere is neglected because we're concerned about, you know, everything in Africa to China to the Arctic. I mean, I do think we do have some uh, relevant concerns in the Arctic, but it's just... Uh, globe spanning and naturally the western hemisphere is just neglected in my view well they could use actual diplomacy promote actual friendship with these countries uh it's it's astounding to me that there's not essentially free trade with on a much more widespread scale yeah there, there's like some latin american free trade agreements and things like that but the, but the trade integration is still very very lacking with Latin America and these, all that stuff you say about how, oh, well, we need, we, we can't have free trade with China because they could cut us off from our steel and everything. There's immense amounts of resources available in Latin America. None of these countries poses any sort of real uh, strategic problem. So it seems like that's the sort of thing you should pursue is rock solid relations with all of these states. But that doesn't seem to be a priority at all. I mean, especially Mexico and Brazil, um, I can't remember the exact place, but they're both in the top 20 largest economies. Um, and I mean, Venezuela has the largest uh, oil reserves, uh, or I guess estimated or proven or however they measure that uh, oil reserves. They have a lot of oil. Yeah. It and way. it's, um, <laughs> uh, I can't remember if we've mentioned this before, but the U.S. has like a NATO-like treaty with like most of the Western Hemisphere, the Rio Treaty, it actually predates the NATO Treaty. And it similarly has an attack on one is an attack on all clause. Um, and it's just sort of like most people don't even know that treaty exists. And um, it's just sort of like I would much rather we focused on the Rio Treaty and the Western Hemisphere rather than all the obsession with NATO, which again, I was very disappointed with that section <laughs> um, because it's just, yes, we're continuing to invest in Europe and, you know, shovel money and resources to Ukraine and blah, blah, blah. No mention of Europe doing nothing um, or well, I mean, relative to us, I mean, we're shouldering an immense amount of the burden. No one other than Poland is, uh, you know, taking actual steps that one would take if you were worried about the Russian threat. Um, and uh, there was some recent talk about how NATO recognizes China as, as an important, um, you know, issue going forward. And there, it's this sort of this weird, I mean, it, back to the mindset of nothing's beyond our capacity. NATO, which, you know, can you know, aside from the U.S., can do next to nothing, is going to, you know, deal with Russia and help the U.S. balance against China and Asia. And uh, on that uh, on that ground, Eric Gomez at Cato had what I thought was a hilarious tweet. Um, this think tank in the U.K. called RUSI, I forget what it stands for, but it's this foreign policy think tank, recently came out with this report on sort of what lessons can we learn from uh, the war in Ukraine in terms of, you know, land warfare. And I have not read the whole report, but The Economist sort of did a, a summary of it. And I'm, you know, take it with a grain of salt because one of the co-authors is a Ukrainian general. So it's like, 
sort of impossible to trust anything <laughs> any Ukrainian government official says because it's, I mean, I would be doing the same thing if I was a Ukrainian, but it's gained towards helping Ukraine. But it points out that before the war started, Ukraine had more um, artillery and multiple launch rocket systems than Britain, France, Italy, Spain, and Poland put together. And Eric Gomez uh, had this funny tweet, stuff like this is why I'm very on board with the Europeans getting their act together on balancing Russia before they try and ride to the rescue in East Asia and recreate the battle of Tsushima. And that's the naval battle where uh, the Russian Baltic fleet sailed all the way around the world to uh, relieve uh, the siege of Port Arthur. And as soon as it arrived, the Japanese sank the entire thing, like thousands of sailors were killed. It was just a complete disaster. It's sort of, that's how I imagine, you know, NATO sending their, like, what help could they be balancing against China when they can't even, you know, seriously balance against Russia in terms of they're just free riding on the U.S. So, <laughs> I mean, uh, I thought that was a vivid picture of what to expect from their help in, <laughs> on that theater. <laughs> that, that tweet that uh, about uh, um, about 100 people found that really, really funny. Because they, <laughs> they got the reference. Yes. <laughs> the, <laughs> but uh, yes, of course, even... even uh, I'm. I know uh, far less about uh, East Asia than about Europe and Latin America, um, but but it's even reached me that uh, that the Russians <laughs> just were completely humiliated uh, by the Japanese in that war, and uh, yeah, a similar <laughs> that image is pr quite grim. If that does prove to be something that uh, the Europeans would attempt to do, which is just basically show up in East Asia, a place where they have really no well-established relations or uh, military um, experience, and that they're going to help the United States uh, expand its power there. I mean, it, it, it really is quite remarkable. And if the U.S. wanted to have any real priorities, it would, yeah, it would just completely get out of NATO and forget about it and say, hey, Europe, you're rich, you're wealthy, and there's 25 countries here or more that, uh, that can get together. But that's not in this report as all, at all, as you noticed. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, if Machiavelli and Zach was the king or something, I mean, we would cut a deal with Russia right away because Russia is much more important if you want to balance against China. Not to comment on you know, getting to the whole thing of what we should be doing about China exactly. But Russia, it's it's sort of like funny, like, I don't know, like 10-ish or, I don't know, 8-ish years ago, people were like, there was these funny, well, to me, sort of funny articles about how, like, the close relationship between Russia and China, which was just sort of budding at that time, was like, this is an aberration of nature. How is this happening? Because they're not natural partners. But instead, we're sort of corralling them into being partners. And it's, it's just sort of this autocracy versus democracy thing. It's, it's very possible. I don't know if it's likely, but it's very possible that going forward, the world will be separated into two sort of economic blocks that are, uh, you know, distinct from each other uh, exactly because of the power that economics has. And it's there's this very funny line um, uh, towards the beginning, um, uh, page 10 of the report, um, complaining about autocratic governments, they leverage access to their markets and control of global digital infrastructure for coercive purposes. And I mean, when we talk about the global world order, really it's the global American economic order because, um, because of you know, the power of our banking system. You know, we can demand people, uh, you know, leverage sanctions against Iran or, you know, abandon Swiss <laughs> secret bank accounts and change the way they, you know, go about their internal economic affairs 
because we have that power and we don't want them to have that power. And I, I mean, I agree that it would be horrible to live in a world where China <laughs> had the power we have to do all these things, but it just sort of made me chuckle that it's like, oh, darn autocracies doing exactly the whole basis of our, you know, geopolitical <laughs> economic strategy. <laughs> it was less than a year ago that we're all talking about removing anyone we don't like from the SWIFT system, the International Bank Trans Communication System. And uh, what is that if not weaponizing the financial system? And that's the phrase the report keeps using over and over again, is they're weaponizing energy, they're weaponizing technology. But it's only other people that do that. And that was something that really just stuck out about this document was just the sheer hypocrisy of it. And that's why I say that it reads a lot like a press release. Yeah. I would have respected the administration and the people behind this report a lot more if they just would have come out and said, we want America to be the most important, most powerful country. And so here's all the, st here's all the ways we're going to uh, use our strategic power to ensure that's that's the way it works, and Americans will benefit from that. Now, I would disagree with that, but I would at least respect the honesty and the straightforwardness of it. And, and other countries probably would as well, rather than just this patina of, oh, we care about the environment, we care about equity, we care about freedom. And it's uh, it's just so obvious nonsense the way that they phrase it all, because it's it's like a laundry list of bad things other regimes do, whereas the U.S. does exactly the same thing. There's a line in there about how Iran interferes in the elections of its neighbors. Yeah. Um, OK, the <laughs> well, I guess they're just taking cues from the CIA. I mean, it's just astounding that uh, that they're pointing out these things that I guess you have to be incredibly naive to think that this is this is some sort of moral flaw that only foreigners have back to the economy real quick. One line I was very confused on, and I mean, it's not my field of expertise, but on page 26, it says that Russia's efforts to weaponize energy have backfired. That's not my understanding of the situation at all. I mean, earlier this year, Russia <laughs> recorded a record profits <laughs> from its oil exports. Um, so I found that Odd. In the Twitter feeds on that ride with just the foreign policy people I follow, there, it seems debatable, right, is that they're looking at what is the total volume of oil and gas coming out of Russia versus the amount of money coming in. And and Russia must be hurting because they keep making with uh, withdrawal uh, or at least peace with Ukraine. I don't think they've offered withdrawal at all, uh, but making peace with Ukraine contingent on the end of sanctions, so therefore the sanctions must be hurting them and all of that. But I agree. Clearly, it's, it has not, uh, the sanctions on oil and gas have by f definitely not uh, driven a nail through the heart of Russian industry because they've managed to find enough partners in India and China and Africa that are still more than happy to deal with that, not to mention Turkey, which is becoming much more of a... Russian partner. Boy, Turkey is just brilliantly playing off NATO against Russia and vice versa. In Now they're talking about making Turkey an, a gas hub. More pipelines going through there. Turkey is managing to turn this all into a way for them to basically invade Kurdistan. And so Russia... Russia has partners, and by offering some cover to the Turks, Turkey's getting more uppity uh, with NATO and demanding more freedom there in exchange for not playing too nice with Russia. So it's really quite remarkable. And in spite of all the big talk in this report, it doesn't seem like the U.S. is actually managing that part of the world very well, at least according to the uh, the standards of this report. Yeah, there was one line about, we want to continue to, you know, make sure Turkey's integrated to the West. And it's like, how? <laughs> in what ways, uh, you know? And I uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I still don't think that Turkey has, um, at least at the time we're recording this, I don't think Turkey has approved uh, Finland and Sweden joining NATO. Um, they said they would, but I don't think they've actually done that yet, um, officially. So, <laughs> Well, and apparently Turkey joining the EU is so much off the table that they haven't even put that back up there as something they would want in return, I guess, for approving 
Finland. Oh, right. Yeah. Remember that? I don't, I, well, I don't know if you're, <laughs> I was it 20 years ago. Eh, it was more like 15 years ago. Just lots of talk about Turkey wanting to be in the EU. And of course, Istanbul is a European country is what they said and so on. But the Europeans just did not show much interest. And I think, I think that still annoys uh, the Turks and is probably actually part of their thinking on all this. Yeah, they're, they're in the purgatory that Ukraine just entered uh, regarding Europe, <laughs> European Union membership. I mean, they've been there since the mid-2000s, I think. Um, and I think that the, the direction Erdogan's going, he, that uh, EU membership could be a detriment in the way that uh, the EU bureaucracy tries to punish Hungary and Poland, et cetera, et cetera, for them doing their own thing. And Turkey's really going off and doing its own thing these days. So I think, uh, uh, yeah, unless it thought that it could influence things in its, the bureaucracy in its favor, I suppose. Right. It's hard to imagine um, Turkey getting uh, getting approval from Brussels on a lot of their election moves. And right. <laughs> I mean, when when's the next attempted coup in Turkey? And, and what would that what sort of sanction would that get from Brussels? Yeah, that's probably an important consideration. Maybe they've just decided that, yeah, that wouldn't be worth the trouble after they see the way Hungary and Poland get treated. Um, so maybe that's that's just dead. So how do you integrate Turkey into the West then. So yeah, yet another thing suggested in the report with like no, just just an expression of this is another thing that we're going to meddle in, but really no outline of how anything would actually be uh, accomplished. And we, when you start to then just look at I guess it's part three of this report then, where it then just looks at the regional strategies. Oh, part four, our strategy by region where, yep, that's where they just go through every single region. It's Indo-Pacific, deepen our alliance with Europe, foster democracy and prosperity in the Western Hemisphere, and support de-escalation and integration in the Middle East. I mean, it's just... Oh, and then at the end, build 21st century U.S.-Africa partnerships. That's uh, that's that's quite quite remarkable. And then protect sea, air, and space. So space also is, uh, that's where we'll send up their Space Force guardians to uh, to ensure there. And then uh, I guess maybe build a new Arctic Ocean fleet. Uh, it's just, uh, how much money is th is this going to cost? Um, clearly more. And there's, there's no end in sight, of course, to uh, Pentagon spending, right? Is that you had Trump in and, Trump at least didn't show much interest in starting new wars, but boy, did Pentagon spending escalate under Trump. And I guess maybe I would prefer that just on the book spending increases for the Pentagon as opposed to a bunch of ad hoc war spending endlessly pumped out for whatever new foreign policy disaster is taking place. That sort of would be akin to I, what happened during the Reagan years, right? Is there was no new big wars. Uh, Reagan showed little interest in in uh, any uh, any long term foreign meddling, but but spending just went through the roof in terms of defense spending. That yeah, that's that's there's an upside to that, right? Even though there's an amazing amount of spending, I would have preferred the the level of. Uh, international meddling under Reagan than we got under Clinton or Obama or Bush. And so that's that's one thing that could happen. But th that's, of course, not not what they want here, whereas we're going to we're going to have a uh, a very battle ready Pentagon and well funded Pentagon. But but we don't have any plans to invade any new parts of the world. But this is basically signaling that if any part of the world gets out of line, that that uh, we're going to be coming riding in. Uh, on uh, our on our drones, on our uh, fifth generation fighters, which we've spent trillions of dollars on and may or may not work. I don't know. And just uh, it, it's clear, right, with all the, the talk about modernization and technology and so on, that uh, spending is just a huge component of this with additional threats to start new wars where necessary. So, yeah, you're right. The line about how nothing's beyond our capacity is clearly supports the overall uh, spirit of the document, which is that no corner of the globe shall be free from American intervention. Yeah, and it, it also, I mean, there's also 
aside from the ideological sort of uh, international uh, liberal hegemony, there's also just the nitty gritty like public choice element. So this is a huge jobs program that employs, I, I mean, I don't know how many <laughs> tens of thousands of people, you know, uh, concerned about, I don't know, uh, malaria nets in somewhere we've never heard of or something. And it's not that maybe we should be sending malaria nets, but it's like, why does the government have to be doing that, et cetera, et cetera. It just employs tons of, you know, Georgetown graduates who, you know, want a comfy job pushing paper around. Uh, I mean, it's just, I mean, there's also that aspect of it as well. Yeah, it's uh, just, this is just a laundry list of what the administration plans to do. And if you can just uh, phrase it in terms of national defense, you're more likely to get friends uh, supporting it. And it's not mentioned here, but uh, that's just such a fail st safe strategy. I'm starting to see articles now saying that the United States needs to adopt central bank digital currencies in order to compete with China. And so there's nothing that's safe from the national security demands it line. And basically, we want to abolish financial freedom or the Chinese win. And I guess th that's the new line instead of Back 20 years ago, you had to do whatever the government said or, quote, the terrorists win. Now it's do what we say or the Chinese win. And that's I guess that's where we're headed. So we should expect, I suppose, the next iteration of this report to include even more about China and how the U.S. needs to be even more involved there, unless there's some sort of reversal toward better relations with the Chinese, and I don't, I don't know if that's on the horizon. I mean, at the same time, it's it's awful in that some Western regimes are are saying that China is a model in terms of digital currencies, in terms of zero COVID, uh, in terms of just some of China's absolute worst policies. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we can't let China have any strategic power. So it's. It, uh, I suppose, just you're getting the worst of both worlds in both of those cases. Yeah, it was quite, uh, the hypocrisy was just amusing, really, at this point, in a, a dark way, I suppose, um, it, criticizing other places. I mean, obviously, there's a world of difference between, you know, free speech in the U.S. and uh, in China or Russia and places like that. Um, but it just sort of was... Uh, uh, everyone was sort of laughing slash angry at um, Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau, like praising the Chinese COVID protesters <laughs> uh, after, you know, what happened in um, Canada and, I mean, just the U.S. I mean, we keep finding out more and more since Elon Musk bought Twitter about how much the government was involved in basically trying to censor information. And obviously, there's it's... It's not on the same level, but it is just like the hypocrisy is amusing. Uh, it just uh, when the government, when the U.S. government is involved in censoring information we don't like on important news platforms, that's all good. But when China does it, ugh, that's that's so different. And it, uh, I also laughed. There was a line about how democracy in America is under attack from within. I found that a little concerning, actually, just sort of uh, people we don't like win democracy under attack. And it just sort of uh, shows just uh, just the ridiculousness that underlies this way of looking at the world. Yeah, they even managed to fit in the whole Donald Trump is a threat to democracy line. Right. Although they, of course, didn't mention him specifically. But yeah, democracy in danger in America which somehow fits under foreign policy. And yeah, so just just part of this whole uh, uh, press release <laughs> national security strategy, an outline of uh, how Biden can uh, plans to bludgeon his political enemies using the uh, uh, the whip of foreign policy. Quite remarkable. So check it out if you want, to, I suppose, to read some black comedy and if you want to know just about what uh, the foreign policy elites uh, would prefer to have in terms of foreign policy. Uh, but hopefully there'll just be enough gridlock in Washington over the next two years that this won't happen. But in terms of the longer scale, I think this will just continue to be the overall goal until the U.S. starts to find itself in real serious financial straits. 
uh, because as long as it just seems that you can print up another trillion dollars and uh, in, you, I mean, I'm sure they're confident they can get interest rates back down to a nice low level so that uh, that doesn't interfere with more military spending in terms of debt service, that uh, everything will just continue as normal. So there's a big assumption that the status quo will continue. And, and if it does, then I, I don't think foreign policy will change, only when people have to start choosing between foreign policy spending and domestic spending. But how soon will that happen? is unclear, and that will require like serious pressure on Washington at least to change that. Uh, so this is this is a nice summary of where we are. It'll be interesting to see uh, what if anything changes in 2024, even with with the Republicans, or if it's just going to be they're going to change some references to domestic policy. There'll be fewer references to global warming and the threat to democracy and all that, but that everything else will be basically the same. Well, that's going to have to be it for this episode of War Economy and State. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next time with a new episode with uh, me and uh, my co-host, Zach. And thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.